Great, thanks, and and thank you all for for coming. It's really gratifying to see so many old friends and and new friends here, and and I think we you know have a real opportunity to move this area forward. So this is great. Um, what I wanted to do was just give you a little bit of a context for some of the things that NHGRI is doing, and kind of you know beat our chest a little bit, but uh, but also perhaps um, let you know as you as you hear topics come up, you know during the, the day people refer to emerge or to other things, and so that just to let you kind of know what those what those are. Um, you're maybe familiar with the uh, a strategic plan that NHGRI put together, uh, Eric Green and, and Mark Geyer, um, about two and a half years ago now, uh, that was published in Nature, and really taking NHGRI, our institute, in a direction we hadn't gone before, which was was to the patient and to the bedside, um, and particularly uh, trying to address things that could be done with medicine, uh, sorry, with genomics in clinical care, in addition to all the other sort of bedrock things that NHGRI does and will continue to do, such as determining the structure of the genome and, and its how it functions and, and how it uh, how it works. Um, so we were asked, I, I was a sort of a subgroup of, of this, to kind of figure out, well, what are the things one could do with, ge with genomic medicine at a time when the term really wasn't even well defined? Um, and, and we came up with sort of five things. And, and one of them was, you know, if you could use it to identify risk, that would be great. Um, we'd like to prevent disease. Who, what physician wouldn't? So that would also be very nice. Um, perhaps improve diagnostics, improve treatments, and increase access. So those were sort of the five things that we had focused on and, and kind of outlining what a, um, uh, an agenda might be for, for this area. And we recognized, I think, at our third genomic medicine meeting, um, when I, I sort of threw out a, a, a definition and got, got uh, queried on it by, by several people around the table that we, we really didn't have a, a formal definition and we needed one. So we came up with one kind of in, in consultation with our genomic medicine working group, and I'll name them for you in a, in a moment, um, and, uh, and then sort of shared it with our council. And, and this is what we came up with, that it was an emerging medical discipline that involves using genomic information about an individual as part of their clinical care for diagnostic or therapy therapeutic decision-making, for example, um, and the other implications of that clinical use in, in sort of policy and other, other aspects. Um, this was a purposely narrow decision, uh, sorry, d definition, and many of the members of our working group said, you know, I, I lead a department of genomic medicine and we do a whole lot more than just using the results in clinical care. But we wanted to keep it narrow um, uh, because we're a small institute and also we wanted to focus on this new area we were moving into. Uh, we also had some, some codicils. This, when, you, when you see a short definition and a, and a long list of other things, that's, that kind of gives you an indication of how much controversy there was in putting together the definition. But, uh, but at any rate, um, there are, are uh, several other aspects of it that I won't go into here. Um, we do have, as, as uh, Jeff and, and Rex both mentioned, uh, Genomic Medicine and Eric, uh, Genomic Medicine Working Group, um, which uh, plans these meetings uh, as well as provides guidance to NHGRI and other areas. They are a subgroup of our advisory council, and they um, um, help us to, to sort of outline infrastructure needs, uh, identify related efforts, and, and review progress overall in implementation. Uh, this is the group here, and they are largely um, um, sort of focused in the, that corner of the room. You might, guys might raise your hands there. So, okay, so there they are. Um, if you have any, anything about the meeting that you'd like to share with them, especially if it's good, please share it with them. If it's, <laughs> if it's, if it's, if it's not good, um, Rex and I will be happy to, to take over that, those aspects. Uh, yes, and I, I might also mention uh, Eric and, and myself, Brad Osenberger and Laura, Laura Rodriguez are all from NHGRI and uh, working with the, with the group. Um, I wanted to list a couple of sort of the early things that, that came up that we were a bit surprised to learn uh, a little less than two years ago that were, were ongoing. I think everybody knew that tumor-based genotype-driven treatment in cancer was going on, but, uh, but there were a few groups that were doing uh, uh, risk, risk and susceptibility testing in relatives of, of cancer patients who bore mutations, and this was going out and actually finding the relatives, not just determining that a, an individual patient uh, had that, uh, uh, those risk variants. Uh, family history collection was ongoing in several sites, uh, whole exome or genome sequencing for unknown disease diagnosis was just beginning, but uh, has taken off um, uh, recently, and complex disease risk advice was also happening in those sites. And Rex um, referred to the, the um, kind of summary paper that we, we published from that meeting, uh, really focused on, on, you know, what would it take to implement this, and maybe teaching other sites who are interested in it what they might uh, need to do um, in, in pursuing that. So we described some ongoing projects, identified some common infrastructure and research needs, which we are now trying to move forward, and this meeting is part of that effort. Um, and then we outlined an implementation framework for investigating and introducing similar programs elsewhere. So there's a, a long um, uh, framework for engaging institutional leadership, choosing the right question, choosing a, an appropriate audience, engaging stakeholders, et cetera. 
I wanted to, uh, to just sort of show for you the, the programs that we've begun and then maybe um, uh, kind of draw them together in terms of how this kind of addresses a, a variety of aspects about uh, implementing um, uh, genomic medicine and advancing that strategy. Uh, shown here are our major programs, um, the goals of these programs, which I won't read each for you, um, the uh, approximate total amount of money uh, devoted to them in the fiscal years that they are um, uh, ongoing. So, um, so these are, are the, the major programs. I wanted to talk a little bit about Emerge, since there are several Emerge PIs in the in the room here, um, and also because it, it is sort of our flagship effort in this in this area. Um, when we started Emerge, uh, actually in 2007, the the question there was, could we use biorepositories, which generally were a hospital saving its stored samples, basically, um, for, that had been used for, for pathology tests in, in various laboratories, um, to, to store away as genomic um, um, resources and get consent for using them in research. And so the question was, can you do that in an effective way? Is there, are there some common methodologies that one can use? And particularly, could you use electronic medical records to do the phenotyping? Um, and the, the answer to that question, which was really quite an unknown at the time, was a resounding yes, and that was really quite, um, quite gratifying. Um, and and relief-inducing for, for many of us. Um, but then in the, in the second phase, which began in 2011, we really wanted to begin to do some implementation. So, so each of the sites was asked to, to identify a pilot. Um, and those programs are shown here. Uh, this one at, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, I, I will describe a, a pharmacogenomic project that we're doing across the sites. But this one is using a special array for uh, the um, cytochrome P450-2D6 uh, for um, uh, gene, which is a, a very, very difficult gene to genotype. To interpret, um, and they have a, a, a different platform that they're using for it, and they're using it in, in interpreting postoperative or, or the use of postoperative opioid, opioids in children. Um, the Children's Hospital of, of uh, Pennsylvania is looking at beta adrenergic ad, uh, agonists and uh, beta adrenergic receptor variants in asthma, in particular, and how one can choose the best drugs for that. Uh, at Geisinger, there's an IL 28B um, uh, project looking at uh, uh, chronic hepatitis C treatment. They're also doing genome sequencing for undiagnosed diseases. Marshfield is looking looking at complement factor H and the risk of age-related macular degeneration because they're heavily focused on eye diseases. Uh, Mayo has a randomized trial of a genomic risk score for coronary disease uh, versus a Framingham score alone. Mount Sinai is, is doing a randomized trial of ApoL1 genotype, uh, a major risk factor for renal disease in uh, African-American hypertensives, um, as clinical risk factors for hypertensive nephropathy, uh, and whether that information um, uh, affects then the effectiveness of prevention and management of hypertension in those patients, sorry, prevention of nephropathy and management of hypertension in those patients. Um, Northwestern is looking at return of the uh, HFE um, mutant mutations in um, um, hemochromatosis and factor V Leiden risk variants on physician and patient attitudes. And Vanderbilt is uh, expanding the, the pharmacogenomics testing that we are, are doing overall and that they have been in the lead in uh, prior to our efforts. We also have an enhanced partnership with the Pharmacogenomics Research Network that is a, a multi-institutional, uh, multi-institute effort of NIH, but it's led by the uh, National Institute of uh, G General Medical Sciences, um, and uh, and this in particular uh, had developed a um, let's see, so uh, sorry, the Heart Institute and, and NHGRI, um, and they have developed what uh, a, a clinical pharmacology implementation consortium, which is uh, primarily focused on developing guidelines for pairing up genes and drugs or gene variants and drugs. Uh, that may affect uh, uh, prescribing or drug selection. Um, and these are published in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. There have been a whole host of them, and they're really very, very effective and a huge amount of work on, on the, these investigators' part, very uh, poorly reimbursed, they would tell us, and, and I would agree with them. Uh, but really, I think, a labor of love um, in, in trying to get these guidelines out, and they have at least as many more in, in development, uh, as, as far as I know. So this was a collaborative project, or is a collaborative project, um, using PGRN's very important pharmacogenomic VIP gene sequencing array, uh, which they developed to identify rare sequence variants in 84 pharmacogenomic genes that they as a group identified as being of a high priority. Uh, 2D6 is on this list, but it has continued to uh, elude um, um, totally effective um, um, uh, assessment, although that assessment is improving with experience. 
And our plan then was basically to take this array and um, implement it in about 9,000 patients in the various um, uh, eMERGE centers um, and uh, use it for their, their basically their clinical care. Um, we, sorry, we liked this model because it could be a uh, exported to other CLIA-certified labs. Obviously, this, this testing has to be done in a CLIA environment in order to be used in clinical care. It permits genotyping of common and rare variants and discovery of new ones, and it uses uh, the CPIC guidelines and institutional approvals for, for um, uh, influencing clinical care. So that program, as it's being implemented, is shown here for the various drugs that are being used. You'll notice that, uh, that there are a number of drugs across the top, but it's certainly not 84 of them. Um, and the, the reason for that was that many of those, it's not quite clear how to implement them, whereas some of these others, particularly those that are used very commonly or uh, in, in common across the eMERGE sites, uh, clopidogrel, simvastatin, and warfarin, um, do have uh, uh, guidelines as well as, um, I think, some experience in, in their use. So those are being used at the majority of the, the uh, adult sites. Um, the pediatric sites, of course, don't use a lot of these particular drugs, and so the, the CHOP group is using a, a, a variety of others, and CCHMC is, is uh, focusing on codeine. One thing that we would like to see, because this is a consortium, is that actually um, with experience and with time, um, they might all come to use all of these drugs. That's kind of a, a pipe dream on our part, but, uh, but it uh, doesn't seem totally uh, impossible. And in fact, a, a lot of that kind of trans, uh, transference is occurring now um, as they, they gain experience with these. I uh, did also want to mention the, the Clinically Relevant Variants Resource, or CRVR, um, program, which was to develop and disseminate consensus information on variants that are appropriate for use in, in clinical care. Uh, that is just beginning. It builds off of a, a number of calls for such a database and consensus process, uh, one that, that I'm familiar with in 2006 uh, was from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, which basically concluded that when genetic results are under consideration, there should be standard criteria or guidelines uh, developed and followed, and they proposed several. Um, and then a list of genetic tests that meet these criteria should be reviewed to identify the tests that are appropriate uh, to consider. Uh, this was revisited and, and uh, uh, reconfirmed in 2010, where the, the, uh, one of the prime recommendations was an independent national central advisory committee uh, to review evidence for genetic risk factors um, and provide that uh, to, to um, uh, institutions and IRBs considering reporting this. So this is what the Clinically Relevant Variance Resource is designed to do. This was an, an RFA that was issued uh, uh, last year and is about to be awarded, so I can't say much more about it, but hopefully at our next meeting you'll hear from them uh, directly. Um, but the purpose is to identify and disseminate consensus information on genetic variants relevant to clinical care, identify the variants with likely implications for care, and incorporate them and, and their evidence into a resource for practice guidelines. We recognize we're not in the position to, to set practice guidelines, but we are in a position to generate the um, uh, information and some consensus recommendations that others can use to, to uh, generate those establish a process for transferring this information to the appropriate clinical organizations and build upon existing programs to reduce uh, duplicative efforts. One of the things that really surprised me, I think, and, and others as well at our June 2011 meeting was that just about every institution that was trying to do genomic medicine was doing this. And they were all reviewing the same evidence, you know, having basically the same processes and often coming up with the same answers. And we thought, well, that's silly. Why, you know, we, we could cover so many more if we sort of, you know, shared efforts and split up the work a bit. And so that's what CRV is designed to do. Um, and this is just a, a comment on what we mean by actionable, but I won't go into that in, in detail. I think at this point I'll kind of skip over the details of some of our other programs um, in the interests of time um, and just sort of ask, are we ready? Um, I'm a big Gary Larson fan, and, uh, and this is a, a mammoth here, and this is, these are mammoth pointer, pointers. Look, easy, Zach, it looks like your dog is onto something. Um, and I think there really is uh, a mammoth in the, in the grass here waiting for us. And as, as we've heard, there are certainly commercial providers that are uh, encouraging this, the public is asking for it, and, and certainly the science is now pushing us in this direction. So, so what will it take? Um, we've heard, of, I think, a, a number of topics that could be included in a strategy, either if we come up with one or those that have been uh, developed by, the, by CAP and the UK and other groups. And we're trying to address those, uh, including, uh, you know, obviously uh, discovering the associations uh, being done in Emerge in our CSER program, and also a, a program I didn't have time to talk about in newborn sequencing, transportable 
level phenotypes, very, very important, and electronic health record integration, also quite important. Generation of evidence, uh, clinical implications of the variants, what evidence is there related to that, uh, addressing consent and community concerns, uh, disseminating methods, uh, reporting variants and, and using them in clinical care, um, educating clinicians and patients, as was, was raised, you know, the, you do want them to order one of these tests. You don't want them to order the wrong one. That would be the last thing that, uh, that you'd, you'd like to see happen. Uh, appropriate decision support and policy development. So I think I'll stop there and, and be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Terry. So one of the things that's not on the list Put, there. Turn your microphone on. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, it is on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I have a natural microphone, but yes, uh, I, I am using this one as well. Um, one of the things that's not on the list there um, uh, relates to uh, economic uh, activities, mm -hmm. and I know that there was a, uh, an RFA issued uh, from the Common Fund uh, related to the economics of personalized medicine, uh, and I was wondering if uh, NHGRI had been involved at all in terms of the uh, project conception and, and review. Yeah, un unfortunately, no. Um, that we're involved in many common fund programs. So those that are not familiar with the NIH Common Fund, it's a, it's an effort from the office of the director to basically um, do things across institutes that no single institute could could do by itself, and that would benefit multiple multiple institutes. So we we have a variety of those programs. We're not involved in this one, um, and and it's one that we, we're kind of keeping an eye on. But we're happy that others are, are taking the fore in that. Sure, it related to personalized medicine, medicine, or just healthcare in general. No, it was uh, definitely uh, for personalized medicine. Okay, I'm just looking at it. It just talks about health economics more broadly. I guess I'm not familiar with it having a, a, a crisp focus on on personalized medicine. Well, and I don't know that personalized medicine was necessarily implied as being genomic, but it, it but it was uh, the the term personalized medicine was used in the RFA. Okay. Oh, Jeff. Uh, Terry, it's, it's clear from some snippets of conversation we've had today, uh, as well as what we're going to hear this afternoon, that the military has a strong um, appetite and expertise and a lot of resources related to uh, a number of the genomic medicine activities that you're highlighting. And I'm just wondering how, how to engage uh, that important group in a number of things which I assume they cannot be active grantees on. And part, so how, is, how does that work? Well, there, there are a variety of ways. I, I, I think I, I could say we probably haven't been as effective as we could be in, in doing that, and, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to see as many members of the military here as, as we have. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we had a, a delegation uh, that came over from the Air Force that included Dr. Sessions and the, the Surgeon General at the time uh, of the Air Force and a number of, of their colleagues who were approaching us basically to ask, you know, we'd like to get into genomics in, in our uh, medical care. We think it's a way that we can really improve uh, the healthcare uh, approach, and we were delighted to hear that. And so we gave them the, you know, resources and information that were available to us, but we also told them about the Emerge Project. Um, and we tell a lot of people about the Emerge Project, and we figured, well, you know, that's we're not going to hear anymore. But to our, our delight, um, Dr. Sessions and her colleagues have um, have come to Emerge meetings, have participated very actively, and, and actually stimulated us to develop a, a policy for affiliate membership in Emerge, and they became our first affiliate member about a month ago. We were thrilled to have them, um, and they need to be up on the, the, uh, the list of Emerge sites, and, and I'll, I'll revise my slides to include them. So, so that's certainly one way to, to get involved you know, directly in some of our research programs. I think including you in some of our advisory groups and, and um, uh, workshops and things is another way to, to be very actively involved. Um, and we would, would welcome suggestions from you as to, to ways that we can further your efforts and, and we, can, we can work together. Good morning. Good morning. So, <clears throat> Terry, this is an amazing array of uh, NHGRI initiatives, and the question I have for you is, in looking over some of these initiatives and um, um, trying to uh, partner on some of them, I'm, I'm wondering uh, to what extent is NHGRI interested in evaluating clinical utility, not just clinical validity, because mm -hmm. the clinical validity and the associations and the eMERGE and uh, the actionable variants are all uh, driven by genotype, phenotype sort of analysis, but the, uh, some of the stumbling blocks and implementation uh, by the payers and the health system has, has been showing the added value mm -hmm. of using the genome versus not using it. So I'm wondering 
which one of these initiatives delves into the utility of the genome? Yeah, no, that's a that's a, an important question, and, and you know, un unfortunately for us, a very big question. So we're a teeny tiny institute. I think we're the fourth smallest of, of all of NIH, um, but we like to think that think of ourselves as the mouse that roared. So um, we, when we develop technologies and approaches, uh, we we try to disseminate them and bring them into into other institutes that have far bigger budgets and far bigger constituencies to be able to test them. And much of what they do is disease specific, where what we do is not disease specific. So, so part of what we do is to, is to try to leverage and, and, you know, kind of bring those groups on, on board where a lot of the evidence generation, frankly, will be done. Uh, a good example of this is the warfarin um, study. So there's a clinical trial, the COAG trial, um, that was something that we brought to NHLBI um, and took several years to, to kind of get off the ground, but it's off the ground now, thank, thank goodness. Um, we also are, are recognizing the need for evidence generation and are beginning this really in sort of pilot programs because that's about all that we can afford. Um, so the eMERGE program program, the, the clinical demonstration projects that I, that I showed you are small. Um, some of them are 100 patients, 200 patients. They're going to teach us how to do this kind of research uh, and also what sorts of outcomes. A lot of, a lot of them are process outcomes rather than patient outcomes, uh, but at least to learn about the process. So that's uh, a lot of what eMERGE is doing. In addition, the genomic medicine demonstration projects are pilots and they are focused pri you know, primarily on showing uh, evidence that, that this actually improves care. So those are starts. They're little starts. Um, the newborn sequencing program, I think we'll be doing some of that as well. Uh, but we really need the, the help and the participation of the larger institutes as well as some of the you know, organized medical systems around the, the table. And I, I would look at the, at the VA and the, um, uh, the military medical systems that, that might want to, to work with us on, on perhaps developing some of these in their systems. Yeah. So Muin has put his finger on the I think what is the, the biggest challenge, and, and Terry's answer is, is, is there. So uh, we are uh, intimately involved in eMERGE, and, and we are doing a big, a big implementation project uh, at Vanderbilt and have been doing it for several years. And one of the key pieces is, is outcomes. The tension is between process outcomes and healthcare outcomes. And there is a, a community within the pharmacogenetics uh, space that that feels that there's this uh, I'll use the word and I'm probably using it wrong uh, this sense of genetic exceptionalism why is genetic information so different from anything else so if I prescribe digoxin a, in a patient and I don't check their serum creatinine I may give them toxicity because they may have renal dysfunction and if I adjust the dose based on the serum creatinine I'm doing that because I understand something about digoxin kinetics and I understand something about digoxin pharmacology. And I don't do it because there's a randomized clinical trial that says anything about how to adjust the dose. And there is this sense that genetics are being held to some different standard than that. I mean, we understand that there's lots of things that go into variability in response to clopidogrel, but one of them is a genetic, uh, is a, is genetic variance. Um, the CPIC guidelines, it's important to say what they are. The CPIC guidelines operate under the premise that you have the genetic information. Now what do you do with it? The premise that many healthcare systems operate under is, do I want that genetic information at all? So once you've decided to get it, and I think we're in an environment where some places have it and some places don't, then the question is, how would you act on it? And there are uh, individuals who are real enthusiasts who, who, who say, well, you know, there's a little bit of data that you could use CYP2D6 genotype to select among antidepressants. And there's never going to be a clinical trial because, there's, because there are many reasons why there's never going to be a clinical trial. But given what we know about the pharmacology and the disposition of these drugs, this one is a better drug to choose than that one in this particular individual with this particular genotype based on what we know. So there's, there's this sense of that you could do implementation um, even in the absence of, of any hard data at all. And then there's other people who say, well, uh, the list of gene drug pairs that we've implemented in CPIC is, is pretty comprehensive right now, pretty complete, and anything beyond that would go beyond data. So there's a tension within the pharmacogenetics community for sure. But I'd be interested in hearing uh, from you, from you, uh, you know, what, what, what's the right way forward in this given these kinds of um, 
precedence that we have, you know, in clinical pharmaco, in clinical pharmacology, without worrying about clinical pharmacogenetics for a second, that, that we understand what there is around variability in response to certain drugs. We understand the factors, and we implement them clinically every single day. And most of what we do clinically when we practice medicine is not based on randomized clinical trials anyway. So, so how is it that we're going to are we going to use genetic information or not? It's clear that the, this is a test that is here, whether you want to use it or not. So I'd be interested in your response to that rant. I mean, this, this is, I think, this is the crux of the issue here. And if we can develop the, the right partnerships around uh, <clears throat> deploying the genome in a way that's uh, consistent with evidence as well as consistent with personalized medicine, I mean, we have to have our you know, both our cake and eat it too. We can't, we can't treat the genome exceptionally, but we can't even give, give it a pass. Right. I mean, it, it shouldn't so, be a genetic exceptionalism or reverse genetic exceptionalism. I mean, ev every uh, biomarker or, or test we do usually falls under evidentiary uh, thresholds and, you know, for coverage and reimbursement. And, and so on and so forth. So I, I think that uh, the demonstration projects, I mean, once you have the genome, you can deploy it, um, you know, a bit at a time. If you take a drug, you, you check out, uh, <clears throat> you know, whether or not you have a slow metabolizer or a fast metabolizer. But the question is, why should we have the genome in the first place? Uh, I think I'll address this a little bit in the afternoon. Uh, Jim Evans had, has made a bold proposal that we should all have our genome tested, not because of the pharmacogenomic, but to find the rare genetic diseases uh, that are not being captured. And then once you have that genome, you've made a case to have it in everybody's medical record, then you can deploy it a little bit at a time. But it's, it's a, I think, a longitudinal discussion that will probably span over multiple years because that's, um, you, you know, we're not going to have the genome and pay for it, no matter how cheap it will become, because uh, there are downstream effects and cascading. You know, once you have the genome, you're going to have the interpretation of the genome and then the, uh, more, more tests and, and so on and so forth. So we, we have to confront this in one way or another. I, I, will, I, I will say one more thing, and that is that the, the one thing we want to make sure of is that along the way we don't make therapeutic decisions based on genomic information that could turn out bad for the patient. That would be <clears throat> bad for the patient, bad for us, and bad for the field. So I don't think we've gotten there yet, so, so I, I can't think of a scenario under which we would use genetic information to guide therapy with, with uh, platelet inhibitor drugs, for example, that would, would be harmful for the patient. I can make something up, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, don't thinking it doesn't mean, make it so, but don't think it's going to happen. So I think that's an important part of this as well. And that relates directly to the issue of, you know, sequencing your genome and, and then finding rare, rare diseases. Most of those rare variants are of uncertain significance anyway. So just to uh, build on what has been said, first of all, I love the phrase, so thank you for that, uh, uh, genetic exceptionalism. Um, okay. Well, the reason I think it's important is I think that we are actually on the cusp of a cultural challenge here. Um, I mean, I think historically biomedical science has made huge investments uh, with the firm belief, conviction, commitment that discovery could only be good. Um, we haven't shared with you that the occasional uh, cynical health services researcher will occasionally make a little graph that compares the NIH budget going up, up, up with the number of uninsured. Uh, so th that's actually the value question here. Well, to be yeah, fair, but, but the no, 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 but the point is that we have never actually held biomedical discoveries to some sort of value question. And I think right now with implementation of the ACA, with the economic climate, which I know is high pressure stuff at NIH and across the federal government, um, but I think particularly acute for NIH just because of things that have to be stopped or put on hold and so forth. So I totally get all that. Um, I do think that is going to be a central uh, strategic question. And the cultural issue, it seems to me, I was thrilled to hear you say that your military colleagues wanted to actually be part of the working group or steering group. I think that's a good thing. In fact, I'd make a recommendation that a lot of these uh, similar types of projects, you would actually seek out that kind of input because 
I think the other uh, approach we've always taken is that what we mean by dissemination and putting stuff into practice is this top-down model, sort of trickle down. And I think we have enough evidence that this just doesn't work. Um, and so I think the feedback back from care delivery projects is also very important. What does this variance mean in real life practice? Uh, what happens when people make therapeutic decisions based on genetic information that they think are terrific and it just doesn't work out so well? Because if we're not actively putting that in place, um, we're not going to know about it. So. so I think that's a great uh, series of discussions and issues that um, help frame the next series of presentations that we're going to have. So I'd encourage everybody to think about this. We hope to have a lot more discussion about this going forward because I think it's important, it's highly relevant to the question of do we need a coordinated strategy across federal um, agencies? And so to that end, we're going to hear a series of presentations from uh, federal agencies about uh, their perspectives on this. So I think these are themes that we're going to come back to over and over again during the course of this meeting. So. Let's, let's move on to the next presentation, which is Larry Myers from the Department of Veterans Affairs.